Hello everyone, it's Gihan Pereira here. I'm really looking forward to this session with this 45 minutes that we've got together to talk about customers and getting customers on your side, being customer centric and understanding how customers' priorities have changed. So we've got 45 minutes working together. I'll give you a little bit of an agenda and how we're gonna run this in a couple of minutes. But I wanna start by asking you a question. It's a bit of a puzzle. It's a kind of a quiz question, but it's a, a little bit of a puzzle. And uh, so if you haven't already got me in speak of you, then if you put me in speak of you that'll be great because then you'll be able to see what i'm doing here uh, but mostly i think you'll be doing that anyway so here's this puzzle it's based on some research that was done by Brandwatch, which is a marketing research company and they were looking at new year's eve resolution so they do consumer marketing research around the world this is some research out of the us but i think we can relate to it here and so they said what do people um put in as in New Year's resolutions. And so they said in 2020, the three most popular New Year's resolutions were these. Number one, uh, reduce or give up drinking. Um, actually, these aren't in order, but these are the top three. Uh, change or improve my job in some way. So that's a little picture of me uh, that I drew uh, showing somebody at their job. Uh, or uh, the third one was to eat more healthily. So those are the three um better job eating more healthy or giving up and reducing drinking so that was the start of 2020 so this is before most of us knew there was a pandemic heading our way so a year ago the year before that in 2019 what do you think were the top three exactly these same three and the year before that in 2018 what do you think were the top three exactly these same three. So people were looking at reducing or giving up drinking, were looking at healthy eating or changing or improving their jobs. Okay, so here's a quick quiz question. In 2021, in 2021, in January this year, according to Brandwatch, what do you think were, I'll give you one of the top three New Year's resolutions that people put down. Okay, so one of the three most popular. And I'm going to ask you in the chat room to have a guess. I'll give you a bit of a hint. A hint is it was not, so the top three for this year were none of the top three for the three previous years. So just have a guess. What do you think they were? So, um, and they're really practical things as well. So these are things that they're going to do. So I can see Vicky says freedom. Yep. So what does that mean? So what would they do with their freedom? So uh, let's see what people are typing in and I'll, I'll read them out as they're coming in, spending more time with family, travel, exercise more, taking a holiday, socialize more, uh, continue to work from home, holidays. Yep, stay healthy, a new career, travel, spend more time with family and friends. Okay, let me tell you what Brandwatch said. So the number three, New Year's resolution, most popular for 2021, was to read more, to do more reading. Interesting. That, that you thought that people who had plenty of time on their hands last year would have done that, but maybe it's given them the incentive to do that, do more of that. Number two was to learn something new. Okay, and again, maybe they did some of that last year as well. Um, and number one, which uh, quite a few people got, was to spend more time with family and friends. So that was the number one, the most popular New Year's Eve resolution for 2021. So the reason I'm sharing this is that, look, I think those are interesting. And I think two of them in particular, I find really interesting. People want to do more of what they found they could do last year. Um, but the real reason I'm sharing this is because I want to just show you that things have changed and priorities have changed. And what happens anytime there's a crisis is people start reevaluating what's important to them and what matters to them. And uh, because what happens is when things are going well, when things are kind of going okay, we go, yeah, she'll be right. It doesn't really matter. We're quite kind of okay with our job. There's some things that we don't like about it, but we'll let them go. Uh, we're okay with where we go out and get our coffee. Um, yeah, it's okay. It's not great, but it's okay. So we'll do that. Uh, we're okay with where our kids are going to school and that's okay. But when there's a crisis, 
people really start sharpening their decision-making skills and they reevaluate what matters. Sometimes it's because they have to, because they might find that money is tight. So they start thinking very carefully about where, where they're spending their money. Uh, it might be because they start thinking about, here's, a, you know, here's somebody, uh, some supplier that we've used all the time in the past, but you know what? Maybe we should consider somebody else. It may also be because somebody else is coming along and disrupting uh, our previous suppliers that we're working with. And so we think differently about uh, what matters to us. And our priorities change. As a result of those changing priorities, we, we decide where we're going to spend our time. We decide where we're going to spend our money. We decide where we're going to put our attention. And we decide where we're going to put our energy. So if you're working in any sort of business or organization, Today is about figuring out what your customers and clients' new priorities are and then what you can do as a result of it. So we've got about 40 minutes working together. This is going to be very interactive, so it's going to involve you. You'll get the most value from this if you take part actively. Uh, there's an exercise coming up soon, and what I'd like you to have for that exercise um, is five bits of paper. Post-it notes are perfect. If you've got a pad of post-it notes handy, that's great. All you need is a little bits of paper that you can write five things on. If you've got business cards and you've got the, the, the blank on the back, they don't have to be your business cards. The five cards are fine. Uh, these kind of little cards here are okay. And if you haven't got any of those, then a bit of paper ripped up into five bits is perfect. So I'm going to ask you to write stuff on the bit of paper and we're going to move those things around because we're going to be talking about priorities. So just have that ready. While, we, while you're doing that, and that also, of course, have some uh, have a pen, so pen or pencil so you can write on. If you normally write on a tablet or on I, iPhone or an iPad with your finger, that's not so useful because you don't want to be ripping that up into five pieces. So while you're doing that, let me tell you about a story and uh, let me tell you a story about about a company who realized that their customer priorities were changing. Um, this is Singapore Airlines. So Singapore Airlines, like most airlines, has had most of their fleet grounded because of the pandemic. And what they decided to do was look at other ways that they could generate revenue. So, you know, one of the things that Qantas did, they had this flight to nowhere, flying out of Sydney, returning to Sydney seven hours later, and flying around some of the East Coast famous landmarks in Australia. And that flight to nowhere sold out in 10 minutes because people were craving the idea of getting on a plane and flying again. Singapore Airlines considered that and they decided not to do that. What they did instead was they offered, and this was at their premium end, they offered uh, fine dining at home because they knew that people were stuck at home. They couldn't go out because Singapore was going through this circuit breaker where there was a bit of a, there was a lockdown in Singapore. People couldn't go out and Singapore Airlines could not offer what they normally offered to their first class passengers and members, which was flying somewhere exotic in luxury. So what they did instead was you could buy for two people uh, a chef to come and cook a fine dining dinner at home for you, um, served with fine wines and Dom Perignon champagne, served on Wedgwood China, which you could get to keep afterwards, and all it would cost you is $900 for that for the privilege of having that luxury experience at home because Singapore Airlines knew that their customers wanted something different now they're still willing to pay but they wanted they couldn't travel but they wanted an experience that would allow them to do what they couldn't normally do so that's an example of a company that said our customers' priorities have changed now. What's something that we can do to bring our products and services in line with their priorities? Okay, so that's what we're going to do today. So I'm, I'm I'm doing this in three parts. So first, we're going to do an exercise together. Uh, well, I'll guide you through this exercise to help you set your customer priorities. Second, about halfway through this exercise, I want you to get some experience of not just doing it in your head and just sitting at your desk, but I want you to get an experience of sharing with others as well. So I'll get you to work in small groups and I'm going to get, uh, you will ask for feedback from the other one or two people in your group for what they think your, they value in the service that you offer. They're not your real customers, they're not your real clients, but I think you'll get some useful feedback from them anyway. And then the last bit, I'll show you where this fits into context with uh, this whole idea of being customer centric, because this one exercise is one part of um, what I normally do with clients where I run this customers on your side masterclass online or in person. And uh, 
I'm not trying to give you a compressed version of that. I'm just taking one element of it and we'll do it in depth. So you can walk away with something that's got some really practical action. As I said, make the most of it, participate, jump in, help your team members when we break into groups. And I really want you to get something that you can get action, that you can take away and put into action later today, tomorrow, next week, when you're thinking about your customers' priorities. Okay, so assuming that you have all got these five post-it notes or bits of paper or card and a pen, what I'm going to ask you to do is write down five reasons that customers buy from you. Um, I'll give you an example. So just to give you an example of how it might work. Um, from, so I did this for me. So I was looking at, I do, um, let's say pre-pandemic, I was doing a lot of conference speaking and I would speak on a stage in front of audiences in person. And now I'm still doing some of that because we have opened up a lot of our travel restrictions and venue capacities, especially in WA, but around Australia as well, but also doing a lot of online presentations. So if I'm looking at what do customers and clients value about booking me as a speaker? And um, let's take as, because you're doing it for a specific product. In this case, I'm going to use the example of online presentations and online keynote presentation. And I've, I've just listed five things here off the top of my head that I think customers and clients book me for. So they say I'm engaging. In other words, I keep people's interest going through the whole session. You can see this today rather than me just lecturing to you. Um, they like my humor. They, uh, they want me to give their audience and their people something that's thought provoking. Um, they want some practical action so people can walk away with one or two things and maybe hope. So uh, they say, we, we'd like you to, so we want our people to feel positive about the future, maybe be optimistic and hopeful. So I wrote those th five things down on my bit of pay, on my five little post-it notes, okay? And you can see, I've been pretty casual about it. So you know, funny and hope aren't like one's an adjective, one's a noun, it doesn't really matter. That's not important. The really important thing is that what you, whatever you write down makes sense to you. Okay, so I'm going to give you a minute now to write down five things, five reasons that customers and clients choose you. By the way, these do not have to be unique. So I'm not the only funny conference speaker out there. So I'm not looking for something that's unique, but I'm looking for something that when clients book me, they know that they're going to get funny, or they know that they're going to get practical actions. They know that they're going to get optimism and positive. Okay, I'll give you a minute to do that. So let me just give you a little timer and just give you a, a don't, don't worry about ranking them. We're going to do that next. Uh, and don't put numbers on the bits of paper, just write down, the, write down those five things. So I'll give you a minute to do that now. Okay, thanks for doing that, everyone. Now, you may not have got the five, you may not have got done five, may not have completed that. Uh, if you can complete it, because it'll be useful for the rest of this exercise. Also, recognize that this is just coming out of your head. It's not necessarily what your customers and clients will say, and we might get to that later. But for the sake of this exercise, what you've got done, there are five reasons that people might choose to do business with you. Can I just ask if anyone wants to share in the chat room any one of their five, and I'll also read them out for other, and you can see them for other people as well, just to get an idea of what we're working with, okay? And they, they don't have to be perfect. They, they don't have to even make sense to the rest of us, but I just want to see. So trust. Yeah, okay, specialist experience. 
become or stay healthy. Yep, relatable, friendly, a can-do attitude, practical, knowledgeable, trusted advisor, plain English. Fantastic. So I can see some things that are really detailed and some things that are quite abstract, like trust. And that's okay. That's okay, because uh, whatever, is, whatever makes sense for you is right and is good. Know the name, see value in what I do. Jonathan's got, uh, yeah, okay, great. Awesome intake team referred by ACAT. Yeah, okay, great. Features challenging, I listen. Um, HK, is that the HK assessment team, Jonathan, I'm thinking? Um, advice in their best interest. Yep, yeah, okay, great. Okay, fantastic. Okay, so here's the next stage of this. And the next stage is what we're going to do is rank them. Okay, and we'll do this in two parts. So one is I'll facilitate this with you, and then I'll have, split you into groups so you can help each other in the last bit of in the final bit of the ranking. Um, let me demonstrate how this ranking is going to work. Um, and the, the way it works is that you figure out we're going to pair them off each of those five things against each other. So in, in a way, it's like having to choose your favorite child. Okay, and everyone says, uh, well, I don't have a favorite, but you know you do. Okay, so let me just let me run through this for you briefly first, and uh, I'll give you one example, and uh, then I'll talk you through it, I'll facilitate it for you. So let's say these are my five, uh, and what I'd like you to do is take your five and place them on your table or on your desk in any order in a row like this. It doesn't matter what the order is, don't try to rank them at this stage. If you have some idea, you're welcome to rank them, but that's not important. This process will do that. So here's what we do. So in this, the first step is that I look at number one and number two. So I'm going engaging and funny. And the question that I'm asking is if somebody books me for an online presentation, which one's more important to them? Is it has to be engaging? In other words, I keep the audience's interest for the whole presentation or is funny more important? And you know what? In some cases, when I speak on stages at conferences in person, people really want funny. And uh, so if, is it okay if, in this case, the question is, if I'm engaging but serious, is that better than funny but not engaging. And I reckon people care about engaging more than funny, especially for online. So I'm going to leave engaging um, to the left to, as number one. Then I look at the next pair. So funny or thought provoking. Well, again, I reckon for online presentations, people actually care about thought provoking more than funny. Not necessarily true speaking in person. Then I look at three versus four. Do people, does a client want me to be funny but not have any action, actionable things for people to take away? Or do they want me to have some practical takeaway value, even if I'm not at all funny? Okay, so you have to be really strict here and go, if I'm not funny at all, but people get value from it with takeaways, is that more important? And I think now for online presentations, actually that's true. They probably do care more about actionable takeaways than that, that they have a funny speaker. And the last one, I'm comparing four and five, and I say, well, if it's, if I'm funny, but I don't give people a feeling optimistic about the future, is that better? Or is it better for me to have people feeling optimistic about the future, but it's completely serious, not funny at all, don't even get to crack a smile. And I go, yeah, you know what, if it comes down to it, they would actually rather have their people walking away with some hope than with funny. Okay, so that's the end of the round. At the end of the round, whichever one is at the very end, which is funny, that one disappears. So that, that becomes, it's like, that's the weakest link, goodbye, that one's gone. So that's this process. So you can see that the way the process works, and I'll get, I'm going to facilitate this with you, is you compare them pair by pair. At the end of the round, the one that was the weakest is the one that gets dropped off the end. Okay, so let me quickly check if there's any questions about that. Um, yeah, Jonathan says I don't have a favorite child. Okay, okay. So that's the process. Let me facilitate that for you uh, in this first round. Okay, so you've got these five things in a row. You've got your five post-it notes laid out. And what I'm now going to do is take you through that. Through Let's just, let's just do one round together. We'll do two rounds together and then I'll split you into groups. Okay, so you've got these five things. What I'd like you to do, let's compare one and two. Look at the first two post-it notes that you've got and the first two things that you've written down and make a decision about which of them is more important for 
uh, your customers and clients when they do business with you. In other words, if they could get one, but not two, so the com- two is completely missing, but they would get one, then one's important. If two's more important, if they could get two, but not one, then it's the other way around. And then if two happens to be more important, then you swap those two around, just move them around on your table. Okay, so I'm only going to give you a few seconds to think about this, but I reckon you can probably figure it out. Next one. If you're choosing between two and three, comparing two and three, whichever is in the second position and the third position now, which may have swapped, that's okay. Which of those two is more important? So if you could get the thing that's in the second position and, sorry, customers could get that, but they couldn't get number three, would that matter more than if they had three and not two? So you know what? Like it's, a, it's like trust came up. So if they could get something for a really good, let's say it was price and trust, if they could get the best price, but they don't trust you, they don't build trust with you and you don't have a trusted relationship, is that more important than them having not the best price, but they've got the trusted relationship? Okay, so you're going to be really strict and be re- a bit ruthless here. All right. So three and four. Okay, so what have you got? For whatever you've got in three and four, contrast those two and swap them if necessary, always moving the more important one towards the left, towards the front of the queue. Okay, and the last one is if you compare four and five, that's the last one for this round, and then compare and swap if you need to swap. Yeah, Lal says this almost reversed the full ranking. And the the way this process works is it's quite thorough uh, that at the end of it, this is round one, at the end of the whole process, you do end up with them ranked the way that you think customers actually, what customers actually care about. And by being ruthless about it, you're forcing forcing yourself to choose. So ideally, you've already decided, you've already said, and I didn't influence you in this, you've already said all of those five things matter to my customers and clients. That's why they do business with us. What I'm now asking you to do is if you had to give them up and you had to rank them, what are you going to end up with? Okay, so at the end of this process, you should now be able to get rid of number five. Okay, so that's it. Round one's complete, number five's gone. Let's do another round and then I'll break you into groups to do the, the next stage. So now you've got one, two, three, and four. Okay, exactly the same process. Whichever are the first two now in place, compare those two. (coughs) If it's the same as before, then that's okay, Uh, but it may not be because some other things may have bubbled up towards the front of the queue. Compare two and three. And compare three and four. And at the end of this process, we then say we can get rid of four and we can get rid of five. Okay, so can I see a quick wave of hands? I can see everyone here. Just uh, just want to get an idea of how many people have completed that. Okay, a lot of people don't have their video on, but that's okay. I can see the people who've got their videos on and pretty much said they've done it. And I can see yeses in the chat room. Okay, how do you feel about doing that? Just in the chat, just share how you felt about it. Because some people really find that uh, find that quite challenging because they have to eliminate things that they didn't really that they think are really important. Okay, um, and again, remember that this is an artificial exercise that we're doing right now uh, because I want to show you enough that you can do it for yourself and with your team later so please do that yeah my poor children lynn says interesting david says revealing fantastic okay good good okay here's what you do now because here's where it gets interesting because so far you've done this completely in your head without involving people externally even i all i did was facilitate that i didn't actually give you ideas about what you should put in there so now let's do this by involving other people And here's what I'd like you to do. So we've got these three uh, that you're left with. 
one, two, and three. Okay, make a decision now without going through this process and order them in the order that you think are the most important. So move things around if you need to, uh, so that you've got one, two, and three. And now number them one, two, and three on your bits of paper. Okay, before, we, before I ask you to open this up to the world, which means working in your groups, uh, just number them in what you think are the three most important things for your customers, your clients, your patients, which of them are the most important. And once you've done that, with the numbers on the bits of paper, so you know what your rankings are, reorder them in alphabetical order. Okay, and there's a reason for this. So with mine, I reckon if I was doing mine, I would probably have ended up that I did this exercise earlier. And I ended up, interestingly, that with online presentations, I reckon people wanted I reckon people wanted them in this order. So they wanted me to be um, giving their people hope, then be more and then be engaging throughout, and then have some practical actions at the end. Okay, so those were my number one, two, three. So where, where I wrote them down, it was to say I put the numbers in as one, two, and three. But then when I ordered them in alphabetical order, it was obviously actions, engaging, hope in that order. Okay, the reason I'm doing this, and it's, it's really for the purpose of this exercise rather than for any real reason that, that that's what matters, is because now when I ask you to, to work in groups, I want you to, hear, so here's how it works. I'm going to break you into groups of three or four people in each group. And if you look at those three things that you've got as number one, two, and three in alphabetical order, what you'll do is this. So let's say uh, I can see in my uh, view, David, Jonathan, and Anne, uh, the first three people who appear in my list. Don't worry, I'm not, I'm not going to ask you to speak. They're just the three people I'm going to use as an example. So what will happen is you'll be in a group of three. David will say to the other two people in the group, um, my three, uh, what I do is blah. These, uh, this is the product or service that I offer, just to give people some context. So for me, I'd say I'm doing online presentations. And David will say, my top three priorities that customers and clients want in alphabetical order are blah, blah, and blah. Which of these is the most important to you? And then Jonathan will say which of, the top, which of those is the, would be the most important for him if he was a client of David's. Anne would say which of them is the most important for her if she was a client of David's. And the only reason I've said to put them in alphabetical order, you can probably figure out now, is that then you're not influencing the other people in your group as to which one you think is the most important. So you're asking other people to say which of them is the most important. And that's a valuable feedback that you get from the world. Now, obviously, these are not your real customers and clients. They may not even know your business or industry. So they're kind of putting themselves in your clients or customers' shoes without really knowing, but that's okay. Because the feedback that you get will be useful. It'll either align with what you ranked as number one, which is, which is a good sign, or it might be different. And that's useful feedback to figure out what might be, uh, what might be their reasoning behind that. Okay, so don't spend a lot of time discussing it. I'm going to give you, I'm going to be reasonably generous in the time that I give you. So I'm going to give you 10 minutes in your groups. So there's plenty of time to have, have some discussion, but I'd rather that you go around first. So David says to Jonathan and Anne, which of, which of them are your top, um, your number one? Don't ask them for all three. Which of them is your number one? They tell you, and then David can say, oh, that's interesting because the one I chose was this. Then switch. So go to the next person and they do, they do that and then go to the next person and they do that. I want everyone to have a go at that and then have some discussions around it. If you want to have questions about it, talk about what was interesting, talk about your ranking versus theirs, uh, talk about maybe they didn't fully understand what you do. That's okay, but give everyone the chance to go around first and then let's have a conversation about it. Any questions about how we're doing this? Okay, so you've got your top three, which you've ranked, but you've also put them in alphabetical order. If you've got any questions, that you want to ask about how this exercise is going to work, then please uh, ask them now. Otherwise, I'll break you into groups. So Camille said, or Karen said, felt like I was depriving my clients of some of my attributes. Yeah, right. And so, so just before I 
break into groups. Let me address what Karen just said here. Um, she said she felt like I was depriving my clients of some of my attributes. And that's right. For this exercise, what you're doing is you're being tough and ruthless to rank them, but you're not like later, like the things that you throw away, you're not actually throwing them away. You still bring them back in, but you're doing it for this exercise purely for the purpose of ranking. Uh, Camille says, very helpful to understand what my value may be. And that's right. And I'm going to talk about the fact that value has changed. And we'll do that when we get back from the groups. Okay, so let me do this. Let me move you into small groups here. All right. Thanks everyone for coming back and thank you everyone for taking part. I think it's really valuable to bounce ideas off people and just to get their feedback because it can be really useful. And uh, even though it wasn't necessarily the real life situation where you're actually going out and talking to real customers and clients, it's really valuable. And the Boston Symphony Orchestra some years ago, they were looking at how they can increase their membership. And so what they did was something which is quite common because they have these concerts, they, they play to concert hall, a concert hall, and they have empty seats. So what they decided to do was they had a special offer for somebody who wasn't a member to come along at a greatly reduced price to come and listen to the, to the orchestra. And what they found was, make sure everyone's muted. So what they found was they invited people along to this one free or very low price concert and they didn't come back. And they were wondering why they didn't come back because they did the, you know, put on a fantastic performance and they wondered, is it the music? Is it that they're just not into classical music? Is it the time they can't make the commitment? And they didn't guess. What they did was they uh, commissioned somebody to go out and survey these people uh, about why they didn't come back and why they chose not to become members. And what they found to their surprise was the number one reason that people gave for making a decision not to come back was parking, was parking. See, what happened was the regular orchestra members, uh, sorry, the regular uh, members of the Boston Symphony Orchestra who supported them, they knew where to park because they would go regularly. But these newcomers, for the first time, they were driving around finding, trying to find a place where they could park. And because they found it difficult, they decided this is just too hard. We're not going to invest the time in making this something that we do regularly. And as a result of that, they were able to change their offering and help them so that they could take that out of the take that out of the picture. So as much as we've done this exercise here with the ideas that came out of your head, remember that when you do it in real life, talk to your customers and clients as well. Um, because that's how you'll get the best value from it. Um, and in fact, what I've spoken about here is just one aspect of getting customers on your side. It's not the whole thing. And let me just briefly explain in the last few minutes that we've got together how that fits in with the, the bigger idea of being customer centric. So you know what we've done and also what you can take away and use um, when, you, when you go away. So I hope you find this exercise useful for you to do with your team and to do with your customers and clients, but it's just one part of a bigger, uh, bigger model. So let me show that to you. So if you think about, so we started and we spent most of our time today looking at it from your customers and clients point of view. So what are the things that they value? And that's exactly the right way to do this. We should start by thinking of our customers and clients, but I also want you to think about what you've got because just because clients or customers want something doesn't mean that you can deliver it to them uh, because you may not have the capability to do that. It may not be something that you can, that you don't have the people to do that. You don't have the resources to do that. So we've got to go from both directions. So what do we have and what do our customers want and bring them together? So this is now looking at that second area, which we won't look at in detail, but I'll show you where what we've done fits into that. So if you think about products, and markets. So you've got some things that uh, you've got products and services. I'm using products to cover both products, services, and experiences, and you've got an existing market for them. You've also got potential new markets. So markets of people who are different from the ones you've got now, and potentially some new products. So what typically businesses do, organizations do, especially when things are going well, is they will look at the existing products and services, they'll look at the existing markets and they'll say, we'll give them more of the same. 
Okay, and uh, it might mean that you get some new customers because uh, for me, for example, speaking at conferences, I'm looking at other people, other clients who might, haven't booked me, who might want me to speak at their conference. That's that's good, but it's still that old market, and I'm, uh, and I'm still delivering that same product to them. The other thing that many businesses do is they say, looking at our, uh, our current market, what can we do to give them more? So this is what Singapore Airlines did. They said, you know, uh, we can't give them the same old products because we literally can't do that. But can we create some new products for people who already know, like, and trust us? Okay, and that's a good thing to do, to think of more products you can sell to your existing clients rather than looking for new customers and clients for your existing products. However, that other thing, that latter thing is something you can do. You can say, I have got, we've got something that other people might find useful as well. So who knew that ordinary consumers would need disposable face masks or reusable face masks uh, as part of their daily lives? The people who make masks who were previously only targeting that to a tiny niche, but now they've found that because there's a need, there's a demand, there's a possibility to um, expand into new markets. And, and the last one is transforming. So you might say, we've got completely new products, uh, or we're going to create completely new products for completely new markets. You don't have to do that, but it is possible. Gin distilleries did this a year ago at the start of the pandemic, when they said, we've got um, customers and clients who uh, actually they still want gin, but they also want a hand sanitizer and we've got the ability to do that. So let's, here's a completely new market because it's basically all consumers, not just gin lovers, and we're gonna create completely new products for them. And that was temporary. A more permanent one was, um, you may have heard the story, like it's often told about Kodak, who got disrupted because they didn't take account of exponential technology. What's not often told is a story of Fuji, Fuji Film, which is a competitor of Kodak's, but they said, well, what we're going to do is look at, we're still going to look at our existing markets, and we're still going to support our existing customers, but also we're going to do other things. And so Fuji has transformed itself into not just a photography business, but uh, they also look at cosmetics, industrial chemistry, and even a COVID-19 drug that they're looking at. So, um, so Fuji said, we're going to transform ourselves. So what we've done today is very much looking at supporting our existing customers and clients, because they might have the same priorities as they had before, or if their priorities have changed, how do we create new products and services for people who already know, like, and trust us. And I did this exercise today rather than all the others that we could do around this whole matrix. I did the one today because I reckon this is a really good place to start. Look at below the line are your existing customers, clients, and patients. And you can say, what can we do to support them? And what new products or services can we create to um, offer them even more value because they already know, like, and trust us. And so that's the best place to look before you look at expanding and transforming. That's it. It doesn't mean you shouldn't do the rest of it. And when I, when I run this masterclass and workshop uh, and we've got more time and we can go in more in depth, we do look at all these areas. But I reckon this is a good place to start. Look at what happens below the line with your existing market and then what can you do for them? Um, any last questions and comments before we finish up? Um, one last thing I would say as a bit of a warning, if you're only looking at below the line here and you're looking at your existing market, that's also the market that gets disrupted first. Below the line is a market that gets disrupted first because what disruptors do is they come in and they take over uh, customers and clients from markets that are already being served. You know, this Uber comes in and the taxi industry says, we've got this captive market, this uh, highly, regula it's highly regulated industry. We can support them. They didn't do much about creating new products and services. They didn't really go out and proactively create high, high quality apps. They didn't really go out and uh, create, um, you know, we'll put your credit card on file so you don't need to pay at all when you just step out of the cab. Uh, they didn't do all of that tracking. They didn't do all the safety tracking that Uber did and Uber came in and disrupted them. So just be aware, I, I think you should start by going support and create, but just be aware that that's generally not enough, but it's a good place to start. All right, and I reckon 
that starting there is a really good place to start when you're mining to get customers on your side. And especially now, because priorities have changed, do this exercise, do it internally and do it externally with your customers and clients and find out what's really important to them. So thank you, everyone. I can see some thank yous coming in saying that was useful. I hope you find it useful right now. And more important than that, um, I really hope that you take it away and again, do it again with the rest of your team and with a little bit more time than we had in this exercise today. So for people who are um, here live, then you know that you can get access to the recording later. And if you're watching the recording, I hope you've been you know, pausing and doing this exercise with your team as well. Um, Thanks everyone for coming along. Thank you for participating and thank you for uh, engaging with your groups, um, in your groups. If you want me to come and do this for your teams as well, very happy to do that. I love doing this sort of stuff online because it allows us to be intimate regardless of where we are in the world, but it also allows us to work in groups. So if you'd like me to do that for, for you and for your teams, then please, uh, let's have a chat about that. Uh, thanks everyone, stay safe and healthy, and I'll see you in the future. Bye for now.